All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm passing out the next uh, problem set. Some of them uh, have, I copied incorrectly and have two copies of the same problem set on one page. Uh, that does not mean you need to hand in two identical copies of the same problem set, although you may if you wish. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Let me start just with a brief uh, administrative note. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So I was going through my schedule. I am going to have to miss a couple of classes in March uh, because I'll be out of town. Uh, so we have a couple options for how to deal with that. Uh, one of which is that I could get someone to substitute lecture for me. Um, uh, the other option is that I could schedule a few makeup classes um, and deliver the lectures myself. I would tend to prefer the second option over the first because I probably move more efficiently and lecture exactly the way I want, and we have a lot to cover this semester. Uh, so I would prefer to schedule makeup classes uh, than uh, instead of having someone else lecture in my stead because uh, I'm a control freak like that. Um, so are Thursdays at 4 p.m. a reasonable time for makeup classes? Uh, there, was, there weren't any objections previously. And uh, moreover, um, it might be more efficient if I schedule the makeup classes before I'm out of town rather than after I'm out of town. Because if I'm at, out of town in March, that means that makeup classes will be in April, which is getting deep into the end of the semester when people tend to be overloaded anyway. So what I would propose is maybe that for the next three weeks, I will have lectures on Thursdays at 4 p.m., uh, so that we can get a little ahead of schedule, um, and that way uh, we can have you guys will have also a nice little break in March uh, when you can focus on other things uh, when there's a little less general relativity going on. Is that reasonable for everyone? Yes. I would make a press anytime Friday. Friday. I remember trying to find times that worked for everyone, and. Well, let's put it this way. We could do Friday from 9 to 10.30. That is, I think, is that would also work for me. You know, oh, wait, no, it doesn't work for me. Uh, no, I will get in trouble with my wife. Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's the day. I'm, yeah. No, Friday uh, morning does not work for me. Um, <laughs> uh, she doesn't live with us, so it's fine. Um, uh, everything I've said is true. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, I remember when we went through our schedule, um, Friday, Tuesday, Thursdays at 4 was the time that seemed to work best. Fridays, we could try Friday afternoons. The problem is the colloquium is 3.30 to 4.30. I don't want to uh, make you guys miss the colloquium, uh, which you should all go to every week, by the way. Uh, uh, so that only leaves that three-hour chunk between about 12.30 and 3.30. Are you guys all free during that chunk? We can try Fridays, say, from 1 to 2.30. You're busy, then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, when are you? From 1 to 2.30. Yeah, see, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, so is there anybody who's busy Thursdays at 4 p.m.? Okay. That seems to be the I'm time. I'm not busy, but there are two assignments usually due on Thursday, and I do everything about the minute. Well, you should <laughs> stop. Well, you should st you should learn not to do that. Consider yeah, this is consider this is my helping you. you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, consider this is my way of helping you. Okay. Um, so, uh, would anyone? Okay. So there will be a makeup class. a makeup class. It's a make, what do you call it when a makeup class is a pre-makeup class. Uh, this Thursday at four. Yes. Just not this week. Is there anybody else who has a problem this week? Because what the problem is just, okay. Makeup class next Thursday. Okay. And if anyone cares to figure out the date, that would be lovely. I have no idea. It's sometime in February, most likely. Um, okay. Uh, and then, um, and future Thursdays as well. Okay. Good. 
It's just that, you know, I have a lot that I want to cover this semester, and so I'm loath to uh, uh, relinquish any lectures whatsoever. Uh, any questions, comments, before we get into some physics? We've got a lot of fun stuff to do today. Today is the day we really start doing some geometry. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Okay, uh, let's do some physics. So last time we began discussing uh, with some degree of precision uh, what it means that space-time has a metric. So let me just remind you that using the Einstein equivalence principle plus special relativity, we concluded that uh, space-time is a manifold along with a way of measuring lengths of a sort, uh, in particular with uh, a way of measuring the invariant line element, ds, uh, which is how you determine the invariant length of a world line through spacetime, which is given by the formula ds squared is g mu nu dx mu, dx nu, where g mu nu is the metric, which is a 0, 2 tensor with three uh, special properties. So first of all, uh, g mu nu is symmetric in its two indices. So uh, in four dimensions, g mu nu might in principle have 16 independent components. Uh, but because it's a symmetric matrix and in fact has only 10 degrees of freedom, 10 functions are required to specify the various components of the metric because of this symmetry. Moreover, the metric is invertible and its inverse is denoted G upper mu nu and is also a symmetric tensor, but now it's a symmetric 2 comma 0 tensor rather than 0 comma 2 tensor, as reflected by the fact that I've written it with two upper indices. And finally, um, the metric has signature uh, minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is just the statement that the metric is diagonalizable all symmetric uh, real matrices uh, with, non, with non-vanishing determinant um, are diagonalizable. And uh, the sign of the eigenvalues, uh, one of them has negative sign and the others have positive sign. This reflects the fact that there is one time direction and three spatial directions in space time. Now, um, once we have a uh, invertible metric, uh, we can do all sorts of things with that metric. Uh, one of the things that we will do henceforth in this course is use the metric and its inverse to raise and lower indices. Remember when you studied uh, your vector calculus classes, uh, you didn't distinguish between upper and lower indices. That's because you are secretly using the flat Cartesian metric of uh, uh, R3, three-dimensional Euclidean space, which is just the identity matrix. So when you raised and lower indices freely, what you were really doing is multiplying vectors uh, by uh, the identity matrix. Now, however, that we're studying spaces in non-trivial coordinate systems or with some non-trivial geometry, uh, we raise and lower indices with a non-trivial metric, G mu nu. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a tensor uh, with three upper indices, g, mu, nu, rho, then you could lower that first index, for example, by multiplying by g, mu, sigma, and you could lower the third index, for example, by multiplying by g, rho, alpha, and then that would be a tensor with two lower indices, sigma, uh, and alpha, and one upper index, nu. And I want to emphasize here that even though we're raising and lowering indices with the metric, uh, the order and the placement of the indices still matter. So 
the order of the indices still matters. So I was careful, for example, in this expression to write the sigma index before the new index and the new index before the alpha index. For example, this allows us to define a one form associated with each vector. So V mu would be G mu nu V nu and likewise a vector associated with each one form. And that allows us to define the norm of a vector uh, V mu for a one form omega mu. So how is that defined? Well, it's defined just how you would expect the norm of a vector is defined um, based on your intuition from vector calculus. So we'll usually denote it uh, v squared is defined to be v mu contract with one lower index contracted with v mu with one upper index with a similar expression for a one form. So the norm squared of a one form would be omega mu with the lower index contracted with omega mu with an upper index. Now, um, there is one important difference, however, with the case with which you are familiar, that of vector calculus. So remember, in vector calculus, uh, the norm of a vector is always positive, but that is no longer true in general relativity because space-time has, uh, has a time-like direction. It has signature uh, minus plus, plus, plus. So that means that V squared might be zero or negative. And so we will see very explicitly some examples of vectors that are uh, uh, don't necessarily have positive norm. Uh, so if the norm of V is positive, then we say that the vector V is space-like. If the norm is zero, we say that it's null. And if the norm is negative, then we say that the vector is time-like. I've been a little sloppy here. I've dropped the uh, absolute value sign. Uh, sometimes I'll be very neurotic and put the absolute value sign there in order to keep you from uh, mixing up V squared with the second component of the vector V in some coordinate system. Uh, so I'll try uh, and remember to put absolute value signs, but I cannot promise that I will always do that. Usually it should be clear from context uh, what I mean by the symbol V with a superscript V. Um, any questions on that? So, yes. You said that the order of indices is important. Mm -hmm. Clearly, if you have two indices at the bottom, it's important because it's row, column, yes. or... But what if you have uh, sum on top and the, the bottom, like the bottom relative to the top? Yes. The order of the indices bottom relative the, to the top is still important. So, for example, uh, uh, if I have some 1, 1 tensor T mu nu, then I, that is not going to be equal in general to T nu nu. Uh, if it were, if I didn't, if I were not careful to distinguish between those two symbols, then when I lowered the indices, uh, that would mean that I would not be careful to distinguish between the order of indices, both of which are lowered or both of both of which are, are raised. So um, the order of the indices very much does matter. Uh, there are certain tensors uh, for which the order does not matter. So, for example, the Kronecker delta symbol is a tensor. Um, as you will prove on the problem set, which is due tomorrow, I believe. Um, and in that case, it turns out that it is a tensor with the property that uh, if we were neurotic, strictly speaking, we should be very careful and write the indices in different orders like that. But uh, it doesn't really matter. And so for the Kronecker delta symbol, for example, uh, we just... Uh, uh, are sloppy and write the two indices above one another. Uh, we'll uh, later this class meet another uh, tensor uh, with a similar property where we don't need to be very careful. Actually, it's not even a tensor, but yes. Good question. 
Uh, other questions? Okay. So, I've been using the word geometry a lot so far this class. But I haven't yet told you exactly what we mean when we say that space-time has a geometry. So, and that the metric of space-time is related to the geometry of space-time. So what I would like to do now is describe exactly what I mean when I say that the metric of space-time has a geometry. So G mu nu determines the geometry of space-time And what do we mean when we say geometry? Well, uh, there are lots of things that you can mean when you say geometry. You could mean that geometry involves the, measure, the, rel the measuring of relative angles between vectors or lines. Or geometry could mean that uh, it'll, geometry is something that allows you to measure lengths of lines and curves and so forth. Uh, it turns out the metric allows you to do all of those things. But the most important thing, and the first thing that I wish to discuss involving the geometry of space-time, is the fact that the metric allows us to determine uh, the length, or uh, more properly, the invariant interval associated or the invariant, the length of any path through space-time. So how does the metric allow us to do that? Well, let's imagine that we have a path, which is to say a world line through space-time, which in a given coordinate system is given by specifying the four coordinates as a function of a single variable lambda, where lambda is just uh, the parameter that smoothly labels points along this world line. So what then is the length or the interval uh, of that world line as measured with the metric? Well, we just integrate. So let's say that the world line begins um, we're interested in beginning at a point lambda naught and ending at a point lambda one. So then we just integrate that line element ds. What was ds? ds was the square root of g mu nu dx mu dx nu. Or if we want to write this as an integral d lambda, it would be the integral of the square root of g mu nu dx nu by d lambda times dx nu by d lambda, all integrated d lambda. So this is the interval or distance between the two points x mu of lambda naught and x mu of lambda 1 as measured along the path that we're looking at, along the world line x mu of lambda. So um, if you want a picture in your mind, we have some path through space-time, and we're interested in starting at a point x mu of lambda naught, ending at a point x mu of lambda 1, the path is parameterized by four functions, x mu of lambda. And then we integrate the arc length. So it's a little hard for me to draw. But if you want to imagine, uh, this is the same sort of diagram that you would draw in your vector calculus class, uh, where you integrate the arc length. So let's see. If you have some displacement dx, say dx1 and dx2, then you integrate that guy all the way up along the curve in order to determine the total length along the curve. So physically, what is the significance of this invariant interval? 
Basically, um, the in interpretation of the invariant interval S is the same as the interpretation in special relativity. So, for, so an observer moving on this path through space-time um, will measure a proper time that is elapsed between the points x mu of lambda naught and x mu of lambda one which is equal to i times this invariant arc length, so, or, this, or this invariant interval. That factor of i appears because they're, uh, just for the same reason it appeared in special relativity, um, it's a convention. I'm using the convention where the metric has signature minus plus plus plus, um, I could, if I wanted to, teach this course using a convention where the metric has signature plus, minus, 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 uh, in which case there would be no i in this formula, but then other formulas would look strange. I happen to prefer the mostly positive as opposed to the mostly negative signature. Uh, that's a matter of taste. Um, if you, uh, in your lives as physicists, encounter other uh, choices of metric signature, uh, you should not be too perturbed by that. Um, it's sick and wrong to use the mostly negative signature, but we live in a free and democratic society uh, where such things are permitted. Any questions? Okay. Now, uh, the distance, as I have defined it, between two points at this point depends on the choice of world line that one is choosing to use to measure that distance. And usually in geometry, we're used to thinking of a distance between two points, which is independent of the choice of path that one uses to measure that distance. So what do we mean precisely by that notion? Well, uh, one can regard the um, arc length s or the invariant interval s between two points as a functional of the world line that connects those two points and a path or world line which extremizes this functional s as a function of the world line connecting two given points is known as a geodesic And the length of this path is known as the geodesic distance uh, between the endpoints x mu of lambda naught and x mu of lambda one. <coughs> Excuse me, and it's that notion of geodesic distance, which is what you have in your mind. <coughs> Excuse me, when you think about the distance between two points. And as uh, I mentioned before, uh, the distance between two points in uh, general relativity does not have to be a real number. It could be zero, or it could be purely imaginary. So, if uh, the geodesic distance S between two points is real, then we say that the points are space-like separated. And if S is imaginary, then we say that the points are null separated, or sorry, are time-like separated. And finally, if S is zero, then we say that the points are null separated. Uh, indeed, if the uh, geodesic distance between two points is real, then those two points cannot be connected 
by a world line corresponding to an observer who moves at less than the speed of light. Whereas, at, whereas if S is imaginary, then the proper time that I wrote down earlier is real. And those two points are connected by a geodesic which moves less than the speed of light. And finally, if S is zero, then they're connected by a light ray, which is a geodesic which moves precisely at the speed of light. There's a question? Yes. Good. And um, you might, okay, uh, I won't comment on that. Yes. Um, at, okay, so it will turn out that S is never complex. It's either purely real or purely imaginary. Sometimes there are funny space times where there's a formal sense in which one can think about complex geodesic distances. Uh, that's a subtlety that I don't I will be distracting if we talk about it right now. But uh, really, S is either always purely real or purely imaginary. Or zero. Well, zero is both purely real and purely imaginary. Any other questions? So this is why I say that the metric gives us a notion of geometry, because the metric allows us to measure the distance between points. And that's a pretty good notion of geometry. So I've told you what a geodesic is, but I haven't told you what a geodesic looks like. So what do geodesics look like? Well, they are uh, the extrema, they're the world lines which extremize the action, which is the integral g mu nu x dot mu x dot mu d lambda. Or, if I wanted to write this a little more succinctly, they extremize the integral ds by d lambda, d lambda. Where ds by d lambda is just this factor right here. The square, inter, the square root of g mu nu, x dot mu, x dot mu. Now, what I would like to do is write down the second order differential equation that x mu of lambda must obey in order to be a geodesic. And how do I do that? Well, I just treat this as a variational problem. I view s as a functional of the paths, and then I extremize under the infinitesimal variation where x mu goes to x mu plus delta x mu. I imagine deforming the path just a little bit. And asking how this uh, invariant interval s varies as I vary the path. And then I demand that to first order in the variation, that uh, variation of s has to be set equal to zero. And that gives me a differential equation which x mu of lambda has to obey. And that's just the Euler-Lagrange equation. It's just the usual equation of motion of mechanics where I treat s as an action uh, as a function of the four variables x mu of lambda. So this is hopefully at least a little bit familiar from you uh, if you did the first problem set where you worked out um, a very simple version of this in flat space time. And now, uh, because I'm a kind and benevolent god, I will uh, work it out for you explicitly uh, for the case where the metric depends on x mu uh, rather than making you work it out uh, yourselves. Uh, any uh, questions before I do so? Okay, so we need to write down the Euler-Lagrange equations. So the variation of s with respect to x mu will involve the sum of two terms. Now, um, okay, everyone take a deep breath. We're going to write down some uh, equations here. Please feel free to stop me uh, if I skip uh, any steps which make this confusing. So um, this equation will have one free index, mu, because there are four degrees of freedom, four variables, x mu of lambda. The first term in this equation, is, lambda here is the free uh, parameter, uh, which labels different points on the geodesic. So the first equation will be d by d lambda, 
of the derivative of the action with respect to x mu dot. So what is that? Well, um, that so the um, Lagrangian here is uh, g mu nu x dot mu x dot nu all under the square root. So the first thing we need to do is take uh, so it's one half times the derivative of g. So let me be a little more explicit here. So this first term is the derivative with respect to x dot mu of the uh, action, which is the square root of g alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta. Now, I've been careful here to use alpha and beta as my dummy indices rather than mu and nu, uh, just so that I don't get confused um, by mixing up the dummy index mu, which appears here, with the free index mu, which appears here as the free index in my equation. And then I need to subtract off d by dx mu of the same action, g alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta. Okay, so let's work that out. So the first term is d by d lambda. So what is the derivative of a square root? Well, it's one half times the derivative of the thing under the square root divided by uh, the square root. So I'll just divide by the square root there. I'll just write that as ds by d lambda. That's the square root. And then I take the derivative with respect to x dot, and there are two terms, one where x dot where the derivative with respect to x dot hits this guy, which gives me g mu beta x dot beta, and another where the derivative hits this guy, which gives me g um, alpha mu x dot alpha, then I can use the fact that the metric is symmetric in the two indices, uh, alpha uh and relabel uh, alpha to beta to just get an overall factor of two, which cancels the one half that came from taking the derivative of the square root. And for the second term, I have a uh, similar contribution. So I get minus one half, I divide by ds by d lambda, and take the derivative of the guy under the square root with respect to x mu. Now, x dot alpha and x dot beta don't depend on x mu, but the metric g alpha beta does. And it depends on x mu. Um, so, in some arbitrary way, so we'll just write the derivative of alpha beta with respect to x mu times x dot alpha x dot beta. So remember, I'm using that uh, slick notation where um, the comma mu refers to d by dx mu. Any questions so far? So these sorts of manipulations where you freely use the fact that g is a symmetric tensor and you relabel indices at will in order to combine terms is the sort of thing that you need to get used to. Okay, let's work this out explicitly. So, um, we need to take d by d lambda of this guy in the parentheses here. So, first, let's work on the denominator ds by d lambda. So, I could work that out explicitly if I wanted to, using the fact that uh, ds by d lambda is the square root of g uh, mu nu x dot mu x dot nu, I won't even bother to do so for reasons which will become clear in a few minutes. So I'll just uh, leave that as minus g mu beta x dot beta times um, the second derivative of s with respect to lambda over ds by d lambda squared. So that's just uh, taking the derivative of the denominator with respect to lambda. 
Now I need to take the derivative of the numerator with respect to lambda. So that means I have a 1 over ds by d lambda times the quantity in the numerator. Um, so what is that? Well, there are two terms there that depend on lambda, one of which is x dot beta. So that's easy to take the derivative with respect to lambda with. I get g mu beta x double dot beta. And I also need to remember the fact that g mu beta itself depends on lambda because the metric is a function of x and x is a function of lambda. So it has some implicit dependence on lambda. So the dependence of that guy on lambda uh, will be given by g mu beta comma alpha x dot alpha where I'm just using the chain rule here to work out the dependence of the metric on lambda times x dot beta. And I have the second term minus one half g alpha beta mu x dot alpha x dot beta which went along for the ride. And in fact what I'll do Okay, let me write that out a little more explicitly. Minus one half g alpha beta mu x dot alpha x dot beta. And you can see I've been rather careful here to make sure that when I use dummy indices, I use them in a way where it's easy to combine this expression here with this expression there. So in fact, I could combine that all and write it a little more simply. So this is zero is minus g mu beta x dot beta times this combination of second derivatives. And what do I get? I have g mu beta x double dot beta plus x dot alpha x dot beta times g mu beta alpha minus one half g alpha beta mu. I'm sorry, I'm not writing this very clearly. Let me move it over so it's a little cl clearer. Plus x dot alpha x dot beta times g mu beta comma alpha minus one half g alpha beta mu. Okay, I'll scroll this up to the top because we have more manipulating to do. Is this set of manipulations clear so far? Any questions? This is just one of those calculations that you should also probably review uh, in the quiet of your own uh, uh, room just to make sure that you understand every single step. Um, I'm doing nothing more or less than applying the Euler-Lagrange equations here. Um, but I'm freely manipulating indices uh, in a way which uh, you may or may not need to review yourselves in order to make everything completely clear. Okay, so let me now rewrite this equation a little bit. So let's uh, move this guy here onto the other side. And I'll write this as g mu beta. So let's write this as g mu beta x double dot beta plus g mu beta comma alpha minus one half g alpha beta comma mu x dot alpha x dot beta is equal to g mu beta x dot beta times d squared s by d lambda over ds by d lambda. So in order to write this a little more neatly, so I have here an equation of motion which looks a lot like the uh, Newton's equation. So Newton's equation says something is equal to ma. A involves the second derivative of the coordinate x with respect to time. I have here this metric sitting in front. And so what I would now like to do is multiply by an inverse metric in order to get rid of that and write this in a form which makes it look a little bit more like Newton's equations. So, for example, I could multiply this whole thing 
thing through by g mu nu, say. And what will I get? I'll get x double dot nu plus g mu nu g mu beta comma alpha minus one half g alpha beta mu x dot alpha x dot beta is equal to x dot beta, sorry, x dot nu d squared s by d lambda squared over ds by d lambda. Now, uh, there's one more piece of notation that I would like to introduce. So, I have this complicated combination of the metric and its derivatives appearing here. I will just give a name to that. I'll call it uh, the Christoffel symbol gamma mu alpha beta, gamma nu alpha beta. So I'll write this as x double dot nu plus gamma nu alpha beta x dot alpha x dot beta is equal to x dot nu d squared s by d lambda squared over ds by d lambda. Where I have defined what is known as the Christoffel symbol, which is equal to um, a combination of the metric and its first derivatives, um, I will actually write this in a slightly different way. So you can see here that the Christoffel symbol is multiplied by something which is symmetric in alpha and beta. So that means that I could, whereas uh, if you look at this combination of derivatives of the metric here, it's not actually symmetric in alpha and beta. The second term is symmetric in alpha and beta, but the first term is not. So I will just write this, this formula for the Christoffel symbol in a way which is symmetric in alpha and beta. Since I'm multiplying it by something symmetric in alpha and beta anyway, it's only the part which is symmetric in alpha and beta that appears in this equation. So I'll just write this formula for the Christoffel symbol as one half g mu beta alpha, g mu, here let's write it like this, alpha comma beta plus g mu beta comma alpha minus g alpha beta comma mu. So, um, and this is known as the Christoffel symbol. Uh, sometimes this quantity is also known as the Christoffel connection. Um, connection being a word with all sorts of heavy mathematical implications. Uh, so sometimes you'll see uh, the word Christoffel connection uh, instead of Christoffel symbol. Uh, technically, they have slightly different meanings from a mathematical point of view, uh, but from a practical point of view, they just mean the symbol that I have written here. And the equation for the geodesic is the second order differential equation, <laughs> x double dot mu plus gamma mu new rho, x dot new, x dot rho, is equal to some function of lambda times x dot new, where f of lambda is that function I wrote above, the second derivative of s with respect to lambda over ds by d lambda. So uh, this page here contains two incredibly important formulas both of which um, you should memorize and tattoo in a convenient place so that you will never lose track of them. The first of these is the formula for the Christoffel symbol. The second of these is the formula for the geodesic equation. Now, you may notice that um, in going from this equation at the top to this equation down here, I have relabeled my indices, nu became a mu, alpha became a nu, and beta became a rho. Um, I do that uh, not because I'm particularly cruel, but just because I think it's very important 
to get used to the fact that the actual symbol that you use for a given index is not important. Um, indices are either free indices or they're summed over. And in either case, as long as you're consistent, you should be uh, very happy and willing to relabel indices um, at will. Um, and so I've written it here in the box uh, in my favorite form where I use mu's, news, and rows. Of course, you could use whatever symbols you want. You could use uh, alpha, you could use beta, you could use elephants and puppies. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as elephants and puppies are summed over the right values. Any questions so far? Yes, sorry, you had a question. In the case that the Christopher symbol is not a tensor, so the order we, of indexing we will get, of is not important? Yes, we will get precisely to that in just a minute. Yes. Now, although, uh, uh, just uh, to answer your question a little more fully, although I have written the Christoffel symbol as a uh, symbol with one upper and two lower indices, uh, it is not a tensor. Um, that's something you showed on your first problem set, although you didn't know you were showing it. Um, and we'll discuss that. That's a very important fact that we will discuss in a minute. Uh, yes, there was another question. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. Yes, another, any other questions? No questions? Okay. Now, this equation would have looked a hell of a lot more complicated if I'd actually worked out what f of lambda was explicitly. But there's a very good reason why I didn't work out what f of lambda is. And the reason is that this parameter lambda is just an arbitrary parameter that we use to label points on uh, our curve. And so if we wanted to, we could always make a new choice of a uh, parameter to label points on the curve. So we could always take instead, say, some new parameter lambda prime, which is a function of lambda. And what would happen if we changed uh, that parameter? Well, that would change f of lambda. And so, in fact, we can always set f of lambda to be whatever function we want it to be. We can set it to be whatever function makes the equations easiest to solve. And in particular, we can always choose our parameter such that f of lambda is equal to zero. So how do we do that? Well, what is f of lambda? f of lambda is proportional to the second derivative of s with respect to lambda. And remember that lambda here is just a parameter that we're using to label points on our curve. So let's just choose um, to label our points as follows. So let's just choose to label um, our points so that lambda is the um, is just given by The, arc, the geodesic distance along our curve from the origin lambda naught. So uh, what, does, what do I mean when I say that? Well, we have some curve here, some world line that goes from some initial to some final values of lambda. And um, for any given point lambda on this curve, I could always calculate the uh, arc length or the invariant interval s between those two points. And so I'll just use that s to label points on the curve. 
So what does that mean? Essentially what we're doing is we're choosing to label points by the invariant arc length uh, from some origin, lambda naught. So what does that mean? That implies that ds by d lambda is equal to a constant and f, which is ds squared by d lambda squared, is equal to zero. So such a parameter lambda is known as an affine parameter. And uh, with such a choice of parameter, the geodesic equation takes the very simple form x double dot mu plus gamma mu nu rho x dot nu x dot rho is equal to zero. And this is the geodesic equation for an affine parameter. And this is the form of the geodesic equation which is simplest to use in most circumstances. There might be some special circumstances where the differential equation which appears uh, in the geodesic equation would be easier to solve using a different parameter. But by and large, this is the simplest version of the geodesic equation. Questions? Okay. So, I introduced here this Christoffel symbol Uh, let me write it down for you again. So g mu nu rho is one half g mu sigma times g nu sigma rho plus g rho sigma nu minus g nu rho sigma. And um, it's worth pausing for a few minutes just to investigate the features of this new object that we have introduced. So the first thing I should do is tell you that even though you have trouble, uh, even though at this point uh, it looks like I've just written down an arbitrary collection of uh, three different derivatives of the metric here, um, it's very important to understand where the relative minus sign comes in uh, in this formula. So you'll see that gamma has two lower indices here and there's an inverse metric here and the term with the minus sign is the one where the two indices of the metric uh, agree with the two lower indices of the Christoffel symbol. And the other guys have positive signs. So that's the trick that you remember in your head to figure out what uh, the um, which terms in the Christoffel symbol have a positive sign and which ones have a negative sign. Okay, so let's think a little bit more um, about what this Christoffel symbol means. Well, the first thing we note is that this Christoffel symbol has um, some interesting properties. The first is that because of the way that we defined it, this Christoffel symbol is symmetric in its two lower indices. Um, and second, more importantly, as uh, was already noted uh, in a question, this Christoffel symbol is not a tensor. And instead, it transforms in a more complicated way under coordinate transformations. And in fact, the transformation of the Christoffel symbol under coordinate transformations was something that you worked out in the first problem set of this semester. You did it for the very specific case of flat space. But uh, in fact, the answer that you derived worked in all cases. So in particular, 
if you were to write out um, the transformation law for the Christoffel symbol in um, a new coordinate system, x mu prime, then you would find that the Christoffel symbol in this new coordinate system is given by the usual tensor transformation law. So, one Jacobian and two inverse Jacobians times the Christoffel symbol in the original coordinate system plus a correction term which depends on the second derivative of the uh, coordinate uh, change. So which depends on the first derivative of the Jacobian matrix. So if you remember in your first problem set, you worked out the equation of motion uh, for a world line in flat space in an arbitrary coordinate system. And you found that there was a extra term that appeared in the equation of motion, which involved this second derivative of the coordinates x prime. And that was uh, a reflection of the fact that the quantity that you were studying there was a Christoffel symbol, which did not transform as a tensor. So the Christoffel symbol is equal to zero in flat space, uh, written in Cartesian coordinates, but it's not zero in flat space written in other coordinates, such as some accelerating or rotating coordinates. And this fact is uh, the fact which leads to all of the famous uh, Coriolis centrifugal and Euler forces uh, in flat space in rotating coordinate system. And it also now, we have seen, can be used to understand uh, the uh, geodesic equation describing uh, the shortest distance between two points in a curved spacetime. Uh, so I actually won't prove uh, this more general Uh, formula for the transformation law of the Christoffel symbol because there's a sense in which you've already worked it out on your problem set and I don't want to bore you uh, by repeating the derivation here. So let me just uh, complete this discussion um, with uh, a few uh, comments. So we should really view the geodesic equation, x double dot mu plus gamma mu mu rho x dot mu x dot rho equals zero as the generalization of the force-free Newton's law. So Newton's law says that um, x double dot mu is equal to zero if you have no forces acting on a particle uh, to some sort of curved background to some sort of curved geometry um, or uh, to some sort of accelerating coordinate system. As we saw in our discussion of the equivalence principle, uh, there's this very deep uh, relationship between gravity and acceleration. So it shouldn't be too surprising to you that the same fictitious forces that arise when you look at Newton's law in an accelerating coordinate system, such as a rotating coordinate system, are very intricately related to those forces or uh, fictitious forces that appear when you try and write down the equation of motion of an object moving on the shortest distance between two points in curved space. And there's a sense in which in writing these equations, just staring at an equation like this, it's difficult, at least if you're just looking in the neighborhood of a point, to distinguish between the effects of the curvature of space-time and being in an accelerated coordinate system. It's only when you consider more uh, global effects that you can determine the difference between the two. And that's what we'll get to next week when we study uh, notions of curvature. 
So um, if you want a picture in your head for what a geodesic is, you should think of a geodesic as not a straight line between two points, but as a path which is as straight as possible Uh, given the fact that space-time itself is curved. So uh, the example that you should think of in your head is that of a sphere. So there's no such thing as a straight line on a sphere, but there are lines which are as straight as possible in the sense that if you were an ant which is crawling along the sphere, you would crawl uh, along a great circle on the sphere, which would appear to be as straight as possible. So here, for example, I've drawn a great circle connecting the North Pole to the equator. Um, but any arc of a great circle is a geodesic. And finally, let me just introduce a little bit of language so, a geodesic is time-like, I guess I said this before, a geodesic is time-like, um, uh, space-like, or null, depending on whether S is imaginary, um, real, or zero. And in fact, although I have not proven it to you, although uh, you can prove it for yourselves, uh, the tangent vector to a space-like curve is space-like. Likewise, the tangent vector to a time-like curve is time-like, and the tangent vector to a null curve is null. So that was the reason for my introducing the norm of a vector and calling the norm of a vector space-like, uh, time-like, or null, depending on whether the norm squared was positive, negative, or real. And um, it's a fact, actually, that the a uh, tangent vector to a geodesic, uh, if it starts out space-like, it will remain space-like all along the geodesic. If it starts out time-like, it will remain time-like all along the ge geodesic. And if it starts out null, it will remain null all along the geodesic. So in fact, it's impossible for a geodesic to start out time-like and then change to space-like, for example. That's not obvious from what I've told you, but it's easy enough to prove. I'll let you guys see if you can try and prove it yourselves. Any questions on geodesics? Geodesics are the basic notion of geometry. They're the first notion of geometry that we encounter in this course, um, and they're the notion of geometry that we will uh, work through um, for the rest of uh, the next week or two. Uh, in developing uh, in more detail and richness our notion of the geometry of space-time. Any questions? The derivation of the geodesic equation was probably the first example in these lectures of a derivation uh, using tensor calculus. Um, it's worth repeating. Um, it's worth getting used to because uh, many of the derivations we will go through uh, in the next week or two, uh, will be similar in character. No questions before I continue? Okay, let's forge ahead. Exciting. Okay. So, the laws of physics are formulated in terms of tensors. And the laws of physics also, for better or worse, involve derivatives. So one of the things that we will need to understand
is how to take derivatives uh, of a general tensor. So what we need in particular is some sort of covariant notion of a derivative. So I introduced to you one sort of derivative already in this class, namely the exterior derivative, which allows you to take the derivative of a very certain type of tensor, namely one which has only lower indices and is anti-symmetric in all of its indices. Um, but uh, that notion of derivative didn't involve any geometry whatsoever. And it turns out that in order to understand uh, more general derivatives, we need some way of incorporating the geometry of space-time. And that's something uh, that uh, we will see momentarily. So let me remind you why it is that it's hard to take derivatives of tensors in general. So if I have a scalar f, then I can take the set of four partial derivatives of the scalar, f comma mu, and if f is a zero, zero tensor, i.e. a scalar, then this guy will be a zero comma one tensor. So that's all well and good. But if we imagine the next case where I have a vector, if you just look at the set of partial derivatives of that vector, so the set of 16 quantities, which are the derivatives of the component of that vector with respect to the four coordinates, then that's an object that has one upper and one lower index, but it is not a one comma one tensor. This is something we checked explicitly. There are terms that appear in the change of coordinates formula for this set of 16 quantities that involve the second derivative of the coordinate transformation, i.e. the first derivative of the Jacobian matrix. So we need some way of fixing that up and finding a way of taking derivatives in order to make this guy a tensor. Okay, so the question that we wish to address is how do we take the derivative of a vector in a covariant way? So we need a new notion of derivative, uh, a covariant derivative, which I will call grad mu v nu, uh, to distinguish it from the partial derivatives that I have written before, which is a one comma one tensor. And I will also demand that this new derivative satisfy some of the properties that we know and love uh, for the normal partial derivatives. So what sort of properties is it reasonable to demand of a derivative operator? So the first thing that, uh, okay, I won't demand that it's linear, but rather I will demand that the derivative is linear. So, for example, the derivative of the sum of two vectors will be the sum of the derivative of those two vectors. Okay, certainly life would be very strange uh, if that were not the case. And the second thing that I will demand is that this notion of derivative satisfies the product rule when I multiply tensors together. Or in particular, that it satisfies what is known as the Leibniz rule for the multiplication of vectors by scalars. So for example, if I have a vector v rho, then I can multiply it times a scalar f to get another vector. And what should this guy be equal to? Well, it should be equal to the derivative of f times v plus f times the derivative of v. That's the product rule. 
And what's the derivative of f? Well, I know how to take the derivative of f. That's just the usual partial derivative. So I will demand that this covariant derivative obeys the product rule with the nice vanilla notion of derivatives of scalars, which seems to work just fine. OK, so let's stare at those two laws. And let's try and imagine what our derivative could look like, uh, which would make it consistent with this linearity and this Leibniz rule. So what could this derivative operator look like? Well, the first thing that should be clear is that it should involve some sort of derivative of v, the components of v, with respect to x mu. And then we want to ask what sort of correction term could we add that would be consistent with these two laws. So now, first of all, if we just had this partial derivative, that would be consistent with these two laws, but it would not be a 1 comma 1 tensor. And my claim is that the only thing that we could do that would be consistent with these two laws would be to add some correction term to this, which is some quantity g rho mu nu times v nu. For some quantity g with one upper and two lower indices. This is what is known as foreshadowing in the business. Indeed, I want you to go through and stare at this formula for a second and verify that this definition of the covariant derivative is linear and also that it will obey the Leibniz rule. The Leibniz rule is one you have to think about for a second. The first thing to notice is that, uh, if you, well, if you just write this out explicitly, you'll see that it obeys the Leibniz rule. And I challenge you to this evening or this weekend when you're reviewing your notes to try and find some other term that you could add to this uh, which would be consistent with uh, the tensorial nature of the covariant derivative along with the linearity and the Leibniz rule. And my claim is that there is no other term that could be added. Okay, so what is g rho mu nu? Well, the salient property of g rho mu nu is that it's whatever it has to be in order to make the covariant derivative of a vector a 1 comma 1 tensor. Okay, remember that the partial derivatives of v do not transform as a tensor. They pick up some awkward second derivative term, which prevents that from being a tensor. So whatever g rho mu nu is, it has to pick up an analogous awkward uh, term under a coordinate transformation to cancel that and make the whole business a tensor. So let's figure that out explicitly. So to make this guy a tensor, um, what do we want? Well, what we need is that if you write out uh, the covariant derivative in a new coordinate system, then that should be equal to the usual uh, Jacobian times the covariant derivative in the original coordinate system. So what is that? Well, let's write that out explicitly in terms of this object g rho mu nu that is uh, d mu v rho plus g rho mu nu v nu. And then uh, we can... Uh, compare this to the formula for the covariant derivative in the primed coordinate system, which would be uh, d by d mu prime 
V rho prime, which we can write out in terms of the unprimed coordinate system as dx rho prime by dx rho V rho plus G rho prime mu prime nu prime V nu prime. So these two guys need to be equal in order for uh, the covariant derivative to transform as a tensor under coordinate transformations. Okay, you can probably see where this is going. So what we do is we then demand that G rho prime mu prime nu prime V nu prime be equal to this guy up here minus this term here. Now there's going to be a cancellation where this guy acts on that vector there. That'll just cancel this term here. And what we'll be left with is the statement that G has to be equal to a tensor. So coming from this term here, so dx mu by d mu prime, dx rho prime by dx rho times g rho mu nu v nu. So that would be the usual tensor transformation law plus a correction term from where this guy hits this derivative here. So minus dx d squared x rho prime by, let's be careful here, dx rho dx mu sorry, mu, and then I need a dx mu by dx mu prime uh, times v rho. Okay. So there is this second derivative correction term. Which accounts for the fact that um, the uh, original partial derivative did not transform as a tensor. So let's write this out a little more clearly. So everything is uh, here multiplied by the vector uh, v. So we'll just relabel our indices. So I'll relabel my row index, a new index, so that everything's multiplied by v nu. And what we see then is that g rho mu nu must transform exactly like the covariant, like the Christoffel symbol, gamma rho mu nu. So indeed, I encourage you to go up to our formula up here. Uh, where is it? I scrolled past it. So this formula here for the coordinate transformation properties of the Christoffel symbol that you derived in the first problem set and check that they're exactly what this correction term appearing in the covariant derivative had to look like. So, in fact, although I will not prove it to you, although it's pretty easy to prove, gamma rho mu nu is the unique object we can form from the metric with the right transformation properties. You might worry uh, that just because gamma is something that works, there could be some other definition uh, involving the metric that would work. Uh, and it turns out that the answer is no. This is the only thing that works. So without any further ado, we define the covariant derivative of a vector v rho 
to be the one comma one tensor uh, which is given by the usual uh, expression involving partial derivatives uh, plus um, a correction term involving the Christoffel symbol. Yes, question. Yes. No. Any other questions? No. Uh, try it. Here's okay. The other thing. Okay. Here, I didn't prove it to you, but I claim that this guy needs to be symmetric in its two indices. <coughs> well. Let's put it this way. You could define, no, let me take that back. You could define uh, derivatives that make sense where those guys, that thing is not symmetric. Um, but that would involve introducing some additional structure in addition to the metric. People do sometimes do that. Uh, it's referred to as torsion. Um, it's a different sort of geometry in addition to metric geometry that one can introduce. Um, I should uh, mention here that here I've introduced the notion of covariant derivative that relies on the metric. If there are other sorts of geometric structures that you want to introduce in your theory, there are other sorts of derivatives associated with them. For example, you can view the gauge fields of electromagnetism as introducing a sort of geometric structure. And there is also a covariant derivative associated with the gauge fields of electromagnetism. Um, I will not uh, delve into that further, but just say that whereas in general relativity, the guiding principle for defining the covariant derivative is invariance under coordinate transformations, in electromagnetism, the guiding principle for the invariance of the covariant derivative is invariance under gauge transformations. And so there is a unique derivative that one can define involving the potentials of electromagnetism that is invariant under gauge transformation. And it can be derived in a very similar manner. Okay. Um, this, I think, is a good place to stop. So I should just end by mentioning that this covariant derivative has many of the properties that we have come to know and love of standard derivative operators. But it also has some novel properties that uh, we have not come to know and love, but which we will come to know and love over the next week. So see you on Wednesday.